The Feast by Max Beerbohm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The hut in which slept the white man was on a clearing between the forest and the river. Silence. The silence murmurous and unquiet of a tropical night brooded over the hut that, baked through by the sun, sweated a vapor beneath the cynical light of the stars. Mahamo lay rigid and watchful at the hut's mouth. In his upturned eyes, and along the polished surface of his lean body, black and immobile, the stars were reflected, creating an illusion of themselves who are illusions. The roofs of the congested trees, writhing in some kind of agony private and eternal, made tenebrous and shifty silhouettes against the sky, like shapes cut out of black paper, by a maniac who pushes them, with his thumb this way and that, irritably, on a concave surface of blue steel. Resin oozed unseen from the upper branches to the trunks, swathed in creepers that clutched and interlocked with tendrils venomous, frantic, and faint. Down below, by force of habit, the lush herbage went through the farce of growth, that farce old and screaming, whose trite end is decomposition. Within the hut the form of the white man, corpulent and pale, was covered with a mosquito net that was itself illusory like everything else, only more so. Flying squadrons of mosquitoes inside its meshes flickered and darted over him, working hard, but keeping silent so as not to excite him from sleep. Cohorts of yellow ants disputed him against cohorts of purple ants, the two kinds slaying one another in thousands. The battle was undecided when suddenly, with no such warning as it gives in some parts of the world, the sun blazed up over the horizon, turning night into day, and the insects vanished back into their camps. The white man ground his knuckles into the corners of his eyes, emitting that snore final and querulous of a middle-aged man to waken rudely. With a gesture brusque but flaccid, he plucked aside the neck and peered around. The bales of cotton cloth, the beads, the brass wire, the bottles of rum, had not been spirited away in the night. So far, so good. The faithful servant of his employers was now at liberty to care for his own interest. He regarded himself, passing his hands over his skin. Hi, Mahamo, he shouted. I've been eaten up. The islander, with one sinuous motion, sprang from the ground through the mouth of the hut. Then, after a glance, he threw high his hands in thanks to such good and evil spirits as had charge of his concerns. In a tone half of reproach, half of apology, he murmured, You white men sometimes say strange things that deceive the heart. Reach me that ammonia bottle, do you hear? answered the white man. This is a pretty place you've brought me to. He took a draught. Christmas Day, too, of all the... But I suppose it seems all right to you, you funny blackamoor, to be here on Christmas Day. We are here on the day appointed, Mr. Williams. It is a feast day of your people? Mr. Williams had lain back with closed eyes on his mat. Nostalgia was doing duty to him for imagination. He was wafted to a bedroom in Marylebone, where in honor of the day he lay late dozing, with great contentment. Outside, a slush of snow in the street, the sound of church bells, from below, a savor of a special cookery. Yes, he said, it is a feast day of my people. Of mine also, said the islander humbly. Is it, though? But they'll do business first? They must first do that. And they'll bring their ivory with them? Every man will bring ivory, answered the islander, with a smile gleaming and wide. How soon will they be here? Has not the sun risen? They are on their way. Well, I hope they'll hurry. The sooner we're off this cursed island of yours, the better. Take all those things out, Mr. Williams added, pointing to the merchandise, and arrange them. Neatly, mind you. In certain circumstances it is right that a man be humored in trifles. Mahamo, having borne out the merchandise, arranged it very neatly. While Mr. Williams made his toilet, the sun in the forest, careless of the doings of white and black men alike, waged their warfare implacably and daily. The forest from its inmost depths sent forth perpetually its legions of shadows that fell dead in the instant of exposure to the enemy, whose rays heroic and absurd its outpost annihilated. There came from those illuminable depths the equitable rumor of myriads of winged things, and crawling things newly roused to the task of killing and being killed. Thence detached itself, little by little, an insidious sound of a drum beaten. 
this sound drew more near. Mr. Williams, issuing from the hut, heard it, stood gaping towards it. Is that them? he asked. That is they, the islander murmured, moving away towards the edge of the forest. Sounds of chanting were now audible accompaniment to the drum. What's that they're singing? asked Mr. Williams. They sing of their business, said Mahamo. Oh, Mr. Williams was slightly shocked. I'd have thought they'd be singing of their feast. It is of their feast they sing. It has been stated that Mr. Williams was not imaginative, but a few years of life and climates alien and temperate had disordered his nerves. There was that in the rhythm of the hymn which made bristle his flesh. Suddenly, when they were very near, the voices ceased, leaving a legacy of silence more sinister than themselves. And now the black spaces between the trees were relieved by bits of white that were the eyeballs and teeth of Mahamo's brethren. It was of their feast. It was of you, they sang, said Mahamo. Look here, cried Mr. Williams, in his voice of a man not to be trifled with. Look here, if you've... He was silenced by the sight of what seemed to be a young sapling sprung up from the ground within a yard of him, a young sapling tremulous with a root of steel. Then a thread-like shadow skimmed the air, and another spear came impinging the ground within an inch of his feet. As he turned in his flight, he saw the goods so neatly arranged at his orders, and there flashed through him, even in the thick of the spears, the thought that he would be a grave loss to his employers. This, for Mr. Williams was, not less than the goods, of a kind easily replaced, was an illusion. It was the last of Mr. Williams' illusions. End of The Feast by Max Beerbaum Recorded by James Christopher JX Christopher at yahoo.com